Our speaker this evening is Dr. Kathleen Stefanos. She's an assistant professor of emergency medicine and pediatrics at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She's board certified in, in pediatrics. She trained at the University of Maryland. Uh, Kathleen is very homegrown, which is awesome. Um, she moved to Rochester, New York, where she worked at a level one adult and pediatric trauma center for six years. There she worked primarily in the education of emergency medicine residents and students. She returned home in 2022 and now splits time between the adult and pediatric emergency departments. She regularly speaks both locally and nationally on a variety of topics, particularly focused on pediatric emergency medicine. Uh, she's kind enough to join us this evening to talk about identifying the subtle signs of child abuse. And then there's a slight possibility that anywhere between one and three children might appear in the background just to egg her on. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Stefanos. Thank you so much. Hopefully my children will uh, stay upstairs and going to bed for, <laughs> for the duration of this. Um, thank you for having me. I'm excited to join you all. Um, and as we talked about, I'm gonna be talking about some subtle signs of non-accidental trauma. So share my screen with us here. So this is when there's more to the story than what we're actually hearing about our patient. And unfortunately, this is the topic that people really don't like to talk about. It's a uh, very unpopular topic because it's obviously dealing with something that people really don't want to be happening at all. We wish that this was not something we had to have a conversation about. But I think everyone here has the opportunity to identify some subtle signs that could really mean the life or death of a pediatric patient. So I think it's a really important topic for us all to discuss. I have no disclosures. So by the end of this talk, I'm hoping that you can really define child abuse, identify some very subtle findings on history and physical exam that may suggest that a non-accidental trauma or child abuse has occurred and appropriately report and triage patients based on that so that you can help identify where they should go ultimately for appropriate medical care. So what is child abuse? It's defined as the actual or potential harm. So down at the bottom of the screen, this is what the World Health Organization defines as child abuse. And it's really kind of a vague description, but anything that could cause harm to the patient. So this includes signs of neglect, physical abuse, psychological abuse, and sexual abuse. Neglect is probably the most common form of child abuse. And we unfortunately will see a lot of this in patient populations that we are dealing with uh, throughout, but physical abuse is what we're gonna be focusing on in this particular talk. Physical abuse itself is defined as beating, shaking, burning, or biting a patient. There is no specific definition as to where corporal punishment falls into the definition of child abuse. This becomes sort of vague, but most people will state that anything that causes physical harm to the patient, leaves marks on a patient, would be defined as physical child abuse. And the, obviously, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends against all forms of spanking, slapping a child, but specifically physical abuse is defined as having these particular findings, beating, shaking, burning, or biting a patient. So what are the numbers? They're unfortunately much higher than probably are even reported, but about five to 16% of all children will experience abuse at some point during their lifetime. So this means anywhere in their entire childhood from one to, or from birth until 18 years of age. In the US, the estimate is about 600,000 per year. While in the worldwide, that is estimated that about 13% of all worldwide pediatric deaths are attributable to child abuse. So that's one point out of 1.2 million um, total deaths, 13% are considered to be due, due to abuse. In the United States, recordings have us up to 2,500. The last data point was from 2021. This is probably an underrepresentation because unfortunately, while trauma has been directly implicated in multiple deaths, they often are not recorded on the death certificate appropriately, does not get counted in the total number per year. 
about 47% of all pediatric patients sustaining child abuse will be under the age of one year of years, which means that they're unable to communicate to us whether or not something has happened to them. So we're going to be looking more closely at this particular patient population. 81% occurs in children under the age of four. 77% is likely attributable to a parental person in the child's life and not someone external to the family situation. The reason why it's so important for us to identify this is if there's no intervention at all, there's up to a 50% chance of a second event, which could be a fatal event, and we want to prevent this from happening. With intervention, though, and when there are family interventions and education to parents, there's actually a 98% chance that there will be no future events that occur. So this means either by having CPS come in and take the child away, um, but even sometimes they do go back to the parents and after parents receive appropriate education and learning and there's intervention, there's actually a, a really high chance that the parent can learn from this event and have no future occurrences. But unfortunately, up to half of all of these are likely missed on their first signs. They present either to an emergency department, to a primary care doctor, uh, maybe even come in or, or get seen at, in any capacity, uh, urgent care, wherever they're seen, they often get missed. And so anyone can be the person that really identifies it and really saves this child's life. Abusive head trauma is the most likely cause of death in pediatric patients. So in here, we see a lot of blood on this pediatric patient's head. There's a lot of edema and swelling. Um, so we, the white here is, is some blood. There's the bleeding here, all the blood throughout here. Usually we see more definition in the, uh, throughout the brain of where the gray and the white matter meet. Um, here you can see it just sort of looks like somebody sort of shaded throughout. It's not equal on both sides. All of that is suggestive of brain edema. So abusive head trauma, uh, patients who receive abusive head trauma have a greater than 20% mortality, and this accounts for the highest am amount of deaths from child abuse. These may present very vaguely with things like just some vomiting, maybe even altered. A lot of this occurs most commonly in shaken baby patients and the very young population. So they may present with very vague symptoms. So you have to look very carefully for other signs that some abuse may have happened. And a lot of times these will have a sentinel event that was missed. The second most common cause of child abuse death is abdominal trauma. So I want to talk a little bit about a patient. So patient comes into the emergency department or calls into to EMS and presents as a child who is just a little bit fussy. There's not anything specific that's going on. They just feel like the patient's been a little bit more fussy than usual. When you get a little more history, it turns out this is the fifth child of this family. Baby is two weeks old, and there's been some stressors in the family with the new on new baby. They don't have a lot of income. It's been hard to get back and forth to appointments. They went to their original follow-up appointment after birth, but didn't make it to their second appointment as scheduled. And when they showed up at two weeks, they were found to have a little bit of jaundice and they did have some, some conjunctival hemorrhages on exam. When you're talking, the family's pretty dissociated when you're talking to them. But when you look at the baby, other than the subjunctival hemorrhages, subconjunctival hemorrhages, there's really not a lot else that you're noticing on the baby. Baby looks pretty well. But when you look at the growth chart and you talk to parents and baby's not been growing as well as expected. And the primary care doctor had been concerned about that as well. They originally told them to present to an emergency department, but they were unable to get there. So they called EMS to come into the emergency department. So we'll get back to them in a little bit. 
When you arrive at a patient's house, you're really going to want to check the scene, right? This is the first step in every patient that we're going to bring into the emergency department. The first step is looking for any signs of obvious abuse. Obviously, if you see someone abusing a child, that's pretty obvious. We can document that. Um, but it's really going to be important to have that documented in, in your report of what occurred at this, the scene. If you're noticing a lot of arguing or disagreement over who's going to come with the patient, over who was involved with what happened. Sometimes there's finger pointing and blaming that occurs at the scene that those of us who are receiving the patient don't re see all of that occur because only one person comes with the patient. That's an important thing to notice. Really noticing if there's that lack of interaction like we saw with the patient in the vignette, the, there's not a lot of interaction. Maybe there's not a lot of connection. Maybe there's some depression going on that has not been identified thus far. And also, if somebody blatantly confesses to abusing a child, obviously, that's going to be something that you're going to notice and, and document at the scene and make sure that's communicated when you arrive. Continuing on, really looking around and making sure that whenever they're reporting what occurred at the home, See if it's plausible. See if there are actually stairs, if they said they fell down the stairs. Are those stairs carpeted? Are, is there carpets all around? And so the fall from a couch onto a carpeted floor doesn't seem very plausible for a broken arm and leg. Um, are there bunk beds? So that's, is there a fall from a height that's actually plausible within the household? And ask for, for collaboration. If there happens to be additional adults or other people around, is there anyone else who can collaborate the story? Because there are some pretty uh, outrageous stories that we sometimes hear. And when we actually find out like other people saw it too, or it got caught on camera, then you're like, oh, okay, it makes sense now. Um, but really finding that additional information can help make the difference between saving a child's life or even implicating somebody with a, a tragic potential outcome when it really wasn't implicated on that, that particular person. And if they're reporting that a burn occurred, looking for the source of that hot water, is the, the spilled object still actually there? Does it seem like it was reasonable that this occurred? Is there that cup or that mug that the kids reportedly pulled down on themselves? Is it visible? Is it available? Um, do they actually have pots of hot water in, around? Uh, is there things where the child could have reached it? Just those sorts of things. The next step is getting your history. You're going to avoid leading questions. So importantly, when you're worried about non-accidental trauma or you're hearing a story that starts to spark your interest or make you a little bit more concerned, you want to make sure you're not sort of leading the patient or getting too much information or pulling out too much because when you are actually interviewing you don't want to record or have contradictory statements from different providers because this could ultimately cause problems in a court of law. So really use a lot of caution when we're talking to the child. So a, if the child is volunteering answers, it's important that you document in quotes what one you asked, but also what the child said if they do report some, some trauma occurs to them. Um, but ultimately, a lot of this does require some specific training in order to specifically get information out of a child. And so if multiple providers have asked the same question, a child may be less willing to tell future providers about what occurred. So you can ask simple things like, what happened? And if they volunteer a bunch of information, but pursuing further details may actually prohibit the forensic examiners long-term from getting a full history because the child may not want to repeat the story. And so, as I mentioned, make sure you're using quotes when you're documenting so that you get a full exact story and it's word for word what you, you're hearing from the family or the patient. So some of the risk factors that you're looking for when you hear about the history if the child's the youngest, particularly in a child where there's greater than in a family, but there's greater than two siblings, there's an increased risk of child abuse to the child because of stressors on the family. Sometimes it can be from older siblings. Uh, about 17% of non-accidental traumas do occur by a teenager. 
Um, patients that are male have a higher risk of child abuse. Infants have a higher risk just because of non verbal abilities and because of crying patients parents will become very frustrated if anybody has a child it's you understand they get frustrating at, at times when you can't understand what's going on and what's wrong with the child um so and then also they are unable to communicate their needs and sometimes parents really have unrealistic expectations of children and feel like children understand what they're going through or understand not to do certain things um, and these are unrealistic expectations but people who don't have an understanding of appropriate developmental milestones can get frustrated with children who are not meeting what they expect to be a normal milestone. Um, adolescents also, there's this sort of double peak of trauma because adolescents can be quite challenging to deal with, again, uh, as they hit those teenage years and become more defiant and explore their boundaries. They can also have a uptick in abuse that occurs. Children that have had a history of failure to thrive. So this kind of can go either way. It's sort of a chicken or the egg. Are they failing to thrive because of the abuse and neglect or are they, the, is the failure to thrive increasing the risk? So children who have a history of failure to thrive in, have an increased risk of non-accidental trauma. And it may be that they are more fussy and because they're failing to thrive and then there's this sort of onset that occurs from it or they're failing to thrive and that's a, just a sign of the abuse. Children who are unplanned, obviously this means that they are a, a more of a stressor than was expected. Parents who were not planning to have a child and suddenly have a child um, may not have really thought out all of the implications that having a child in their life would mean. There's again a chicken or the egg situation with prematurity. This has been a question again. Uh, patients who have a history of prematurity do seem to have a higher rate of non-accidental trauma. However, there is also an association with high medical needs, which prematurity has a rate, higher rate of high medical needs. So there has not been studies done specifically to delineate if it's premature infants with high medical needs or prematurity itself. Uh, but the need to care for a child extensively, particularly in the early stages of life, is a major stressor on families and results in lack of sleep and can result in higher levels of anxiety, depression, and then ultimately abuse in children. Risk factors from the parent. So if the parent is experiencing domestic violence, this is a obvious risk factor. If they received abuse as a child themselves, that's a risk as well. Um, if they are living in poverty, now this is not to say that all patients who have non-accidental traumas are coming from poverty, um, but it certainly increases the risk. Single parents have a higher risk, and actually in, in single parent households, there is a uptick in a non-related male being involved in the abuse of a child. Young parents, parents who have a history of depression or other mental health disorder have a higher rate of abuse. Other stressors, if they're having other things like medical issues, if they've just moved, if they are between jobs or trying to make ends meet, again, that goes back to the poverty side, but if they, they are having other stressors in their life that are not related specifically to these other things that can also increase the risk. If they have no social support or if they have a history of substance abuse, all of these increase the risk of trauma to a child. So big red flags in the history additionally are if they're not separating. So if a parent refuses to leave the child for any reason. Um, now, obviously, from an EMS standpoint, there's going to likely be a parent coming with the child to the emergency department. Um, however, but if they won't let the child out of their sight, even to like step away or won't let anybody else talk to the medical providers, that's a, an alarm. If the history is really vague, if they aren't sure what happened and it's at an age where you would expect that they should be watching their child more, this is a concern. If the history is really age inappropriate, so if you're hearing about a 
one month old who rolled four times to fall off of a bed, um, that's really unusual for a one-year-old to be able to do that. Um, if you're hearing about a five-month-old who climbed into a bathtub, that's really not age appropriate. Um, so finding out a history that's really not fitting with the description of what occurred and the age of the child and what you're seeing the child do. Now, if you hear, they say, oh, my child rolled off the bed and they're four months old. And you're like, well, that seems a little young for rolling four times off the bed. But then you watch the child roll. That makes sense. But if it's really not age appropriate, that's an alarm. A history that doesn't fit with the injury. So a child that rolls off of a couch onto a carpeted floor and has swelling and tenderness on an arm and a leg, that's really unusual. It would be very weird for a child to fall that short of a distance and injure two extremities to the point where you're worried about a fracture. So, or things like uh, the child who is covered in burns, got mom, the water splashed while mom was holding them and mom has no burns on them. Um, so those sorts of things. If the history changes, if it was maybe somebody, maybe the kid fell down the stairs and then it was, oh, the sibling pushed them down the stairs. Oh, and then dad was holding them and they fell down the stairs and the story's constantly changing. That's an alarm. If there are delayed presentations, so if you show up and they say, oh yeah, well, he fell yesterday and his arm looked weird, but we didn't come in because we thought maybe he would get better. Um, you know, if one, it's one thing if they fall and there's no obvious deformity, but if they're like, well, we were just waiting to see if it would get, get better about something that's obviously a traumatic injury, um, that's not okay. And then if there's a sudden mental status change, so a kid that was walking, talking, acting normally, and was totally fine, and then is suddenly not, that's a really unusual history finding. It could mean that they got into something and ingested some, some substance, um, but it also could mean that there's a shaken baby component or a non-accidental head trauma going on. And so we really have to consider that. Or it could be more serious abuse than beyond that, um, where if they're starting to have some intra-abdominal hemorrhage. Some pieces to this. So a fall from a bed, probably one of the most common things we see in the emergency department is falls from beds because kids just roll off the bed all the time. Um, there was actually a large study done of about a thousand children, and they found that in all thousand children, there was only one long bone fracture, and that was with a patient who had osteogenesis imperfecta, one clavicle fracture, and 10 skull fractures. So skull fracture, totally plausible from falling off of the bed, but they ultimately had no symptomatic intracranial injury. That means that no one required significant intervention from falling from a bed. This was just from a standard height bed that is not including bunk beds. But this is an important study because it shows that falling from a bed should not give you a significant head injury that would cause vomiting, altered mental status. Um, that makes you have a little bit more alarm. What about falling downstairs? So someone looked into over 300 intestinal perforations and none of them came from a fall downstairs. So I like to think about in children, obviously does not apply to adults or larger, larger humans, um, but in very small children, if they fall down the stairs, it's almost like a series of very small falls. Um, they just kind of tumble down multiple steps. So it's a series of falls and you do have to worry about them having injuries, but they usually will not have significant injury from falling down um, a couple stairs. Um, and they certainly won't have intestinal perforation because they tend to not land directly on their abdomen. And ultimately, in a larger scale study, only one in two million children have a risk of dying from an indoor fall. So that is from just an isolated indoor fall. And I believe bunk beds were excluded from this study. Um, but they looked into all these children who fell and you really have a very low risk of dying from falling inside as a child, not as an adult. <laughs> Adults is a whole different level. Um, however, this is an important thing to think about. So when you're seeing significant injuries in a child who fell inside, you start to think about more non-accidental or child abuse occurring.
Moving on to the past medical history. So we're going to ask specifically about any history of injuries, any history of fractures or burns, specifically focusing on rib fractures. If they've ever had a rib fracture, that's very unusual or bleeding or bruising. The reason it's really important that you ask this question is what, like I mentioned, half of all child abuse cases can are likely being missed. So that means you might be the one identifying that this child had a non-accidental trauma that really should have been identified in the past. And so now knowing what you know on your exam today, you can think back and say, hey, that fracture or that reported rib fracture or that burn probably wasn't not wasn't a accident after all. And you may be the one to to first identify this. It is important also to make sure that we're not missing other things like osteogenesis imperfecta or bleeding disorders. So asking about easy bleeding and bruising is also really helpful. In the past medical history, some red flags, again, are age inappropriate um, in injuries, uh, um, as well as fractures. So um, specifically long bone fractures in non-ambulatory patients. Met metaphyseal lesions, um, I'll show you an image of those in just a second. So that's right at the growth plate. There should never be a fracture at that edge of the growth plate. It suggests that someone grabbed the end of a child and rapidly yanked upward or downward on the, the limb. And that causes these little fractures, they're little corner fractures on the metaphyseal, metaphysis. Any distal humerus fracture, again, um, can be a sign that there's, there's a non-accidental cause. Rib fractures are uh, un very unusual in pediatric patients, but particularly posterior rib fractures. Scapular fractures, sternal fractures, and spinous process fractures all require a really high level of trauma in order to develop a fracture from this. It's really hard to break any of these bones in anyone, but it's especially hard in children because they're so pliable. They have a lot of laxity to their, their joints. They have these growth plates. Everything's almost cartilaginous. If you look at, as I show you the x-ray on the next page, you almost can't see a lot of the bone because it's just still developing and not even present. So it's really hard to break these, these areas of the body. So if you're seeing these fractures or somebody reports these fractures, that should give you a flag that maybe what you're seeing today is also a sign of, of abuse. Um, so this is that picture, as I mentioned. So the metaphysis is right at the base of the long bone. Um, it is right. So this is the growth plate, this black area. Um, and so, and then here we have the, the very end of the, your, your bone. So as we look across at the very edges, there are tiny little chip fractures present. They're not as easily viewed on this image, this side of the image, but that is a sign that this child was grabbed and yanked, and that can cause these little, little chip fractures as they get swung. Rib fractures are an interesting point. As I mentioned, things are much more pliable. So rib fractures in birth, there is one study out there that says that rib fractures can very, very rarely occur in birth, but always in association with a clavicle fracture. They do not occur in isolation and they don't occur in the posterior ribs. In CPR, this is always the question and parents will like to say that there this may be a contributing factor, but less than 1% of children who receive CPR will have rib fractures. This is totally different than our adult patients. So if a parent's saying, oh, I did CPR and that's why they broke their ribs, that could is an unlikely cause of the actual rib fractures, unless they have a bone disease that could attribute to highly fragile bones. Um, so in this particular patient right here, and here we see rib fractures that are, are present. There's actually one here as well. And likely along here. This is just a picture of a clavicle fracture. This is actually a very normal fracture to have. It's the most common fracture in all of pediatrics. Um, babies will have these at the time of birth, not infrequently. 
especially larger gestational babies um, will have these the large for gestational age babies will have a fracture um, as they pass through the birth canal. So on examination, we're gonna focus on several different areas and we'll just walk through all of these. So when you're looking at your vital signs, hopefully you don't have your patient go to that, but you're looking for bradycardia and hypertension. These can be signs of a, obviously for, for intracranial um, increased pressure. And this will be a sign that your patient is possibly sustaining a non-accidental trauma. So if you get bradycardia and hypertension for age in a young child, you're also going to be considering that the altered mental status in a child may be related to non-accidental trauma. For tachycardia and hypotension, you're going to start worrying, obviously, about more serious hemorrhagic trauma that's occurred to the child. And if you get an EKG that has really deep T waves, this is true for adults and children. If you see these deep T waves in the precordial leads, that's going to tip you off that maybe this patient's starting to herniate and having severe increased intracranial pressures. Next, you're going to look at their head. The first thing to do is if they have a fontanelle, feel for it. It should not be bulging. You're going to look for any signs of bruising around the head any hematomas that have occurred. Oh. And particularly if they're saying they fell and landed on their head, you really should only see bruising in one particular spot. You don't wanna see it in multiple different locations because that would suggest that they've hit multiple different areas. And that would be really atypical for a fall. They don't typically fall and bounce. Um, so that would be a really unusual finding. The eyes. So the eyes are one of the most common missed areas for non-accidental traumas in children. And this could be a critical finding in a pediatric patient. So laceration of the eye itself is unusual. So uh, lacerations more typically occur on the forehead or the eyebrow as the kid falls and strikes their head. Um, they usually do not have lacerations of the eye or around the actual eyelid. Any bruising to the eyelid, specifically um, the upper eyelid, is very atypical because, again, children do not fall onto the eyelid itself. They would get struck, fall, and land on either their nose or their, their forehead, not onto the eye. And finally, subconjunctival hemorrhages. So for subconjunctival hemorrhages, these are the rupture of blood vessels that align, align along the conjunctiva. And these occur because of increased thoracic pressure. Now, some percentage of patients will have these at delivery. It's somewhere between two and 46%. Some people say 1%. It's really variable depending upon what literature you read. There's a higher incidence in vaginal deliveries, a higher incidence in multiparous patients. Um, but these patients that getting squeezed through the birth canal have that increased thoracic pressure. However, by about two weeks of age, they should really have completely resolved or be almost nearly resolved. And having bilateral is less common than having unilateral some conjunctival hemorrhages. They're more often when it's due to delivery, we'll have some petechiae of the face and it should be documented and pam parents and family providers should be aware that this occurred. Uh, because it will appear pretty much right away at the time of delivery. So it's not subtle and they're, they're easily visible. You can find these on exam, um, but they can be re really a sign of this th increased thoracic pressure once you get outside of that delivery phase. So if it was not present at birth, if you see subconjunctival hemorrhages in a child, especially a young child, you really have to consider that this may be abuse. The, the, Risk is that the child was grabbed, squeezed along the chest, or shaken. These are all concerning findings. 33% of children who have subconjunctival hemorrhages that did not have it at the time of delivery will have an occult fracture. Moving to the ears. So you're going to, again, look for any bruising. So bruising does not typically occur on the ears. Now, there are obviously situations where kids fall and land directly on their ears. They do stick out from the head at, 
depending upon the child, um, and they can strike their ear. Um, however, bruising on the ears, particularly in small, like squeeze-like patterns with fingerprint patterns, is concerning that some child, the child has been squeezed or bruised on the ear. Um, any bleeding coming out of the ear. Now, of course, this could be that the kid stuck something in their ear, um, and that, that happens as well. But based on the clinical context, bleeding from the ear could be concerning. And then hematomas. So when you see actual swelling outward from the, the pinna, it can be more subtle. Um, these can also be a sign of a, a tr trauma. The mouth is probably the second most common area that gets missed as a non-accidental trauma. So any oral injury, particularly in children under the age of about six months, uh, and even really anyone under one when they're not walking yet, uh, any oral injury is concerning. So here we see a torn frenulum. Any frenulum laceration here or below the tongue is concern for someone shoving something forcefully into the mouth of the child. So this could be a bottle, a pacifier being shoved into the mouth um, or some other foreign object. Um, any bruising that you see in the palate, particularly in the posterior palate is concerning as well. Again, if you see any burns in the mouth, these are all uh, concerning for non-accidental trauma. And unfortunately, again, this gets often missed because it can be so subtle, people don't necessarily look, or people give other explanations that the child fell and it, the frenulum tore. Once they're running around and walking, they can in fact tear the upper frenulum, but they typically will not tear uh, their lower tongue region. Um, they might bite their tongue, but they won't tear under the tongue. If you see any corner scarring along the sides of the mouth, um, this is suggestive of possibly the child being gagged. So you would wanna also note that on your exam. When you're looking at the skin, you're gonna be looking for bruises and burns, any bleeding, um, any swelling or deformities, any areas of specific tenderness, any hairs that are tied around fingers or toes, or any bite marks. Um, so if you're th talking to your patient, now I'm not sure what happened to this particular person, um, but it is a little unusual that this person has some scrapes on the upper arm and lower arm, but has elbow sparing. Um, that's a little bit odd that they did not, whatever they scraped against did not scrape against their elbow. Um, again, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen, but that should make you a little bit more suspicious, like what happened here? When you're looking at bruises, this is my, my personal child decided to demonstrate immediately for me. This is her shin from falling down this week. Um, you're going to use the, the 10 four faces P mnemonic. So it's a pretty straightforward. This is a pretty well accepted mnemonic. So uh, it comes from the face it organization. Um, so any bruises on the trunk, ears or neck, especially on the posterior nape of the neck, should be concerning for non-accidental trauma. Any children under four months of age who have any bruises, it's concerning because these children shouldn't be getting up and moving. They don't have the ability to move around to get a bruise. Now, once they get beyond that and they can crawl and, and move around, then it's not as un un unusual. Um, looking at the frenulum, the angle of the jaw, the cheeks, the eyelids and the subconjunctiva, as we mentioned, and then finally looking for any pattern of bruising. Um, so what did they fall on? Did they, you know, sometimes they can fall on something that's slightly patterned, but usually it would land on one of the, none of these specific areas that are of, a, of alarm. And then the big thing people say, if they can't cruise, they can't bruise. So if they can't get around, they shouldn't be able to bruise themselves. So even crawling babies, the most they'll do is sort of bump the front of their face. They don't typically bruise their arms and legs. Um, once they're up and walking, all bets are off for arms and legs though. For burns, the highest risk is actually in the three to four year old age group for burn. These children, are, it's more related often to potty training um, and all burns should be treated with a concern for possible abuse because there is such a high risk of burn be, burns being related to either neglect or or physical abuse. You're going to be looking at the shape of the burn to determine whether you think it's likely to be uh, 
consistent with what you're hearing. So in this particular patient, this looks like a likely a splash. So it looks like water or uh, some sort of liquid fell onto this child. It probably got trapped between their arm and their chest, which is why you're seeing more burn here. Um, and then you can see that it kind of extends out. Um, and then we have like a splatter. So that's very consistent with a splash. Now, if the family's giving the same story, a similar history, then that would make sense. This makes sense to be a, a, a typical burn. Now, if they gave a story of they touched a hot iron, that wouldn't make sense with what you're seeing here. Assess the area, making sure that around, like I said before, making sure that this the scene makes sense and that what they told you happened makes sense with what you're seeing on the scene. And then check the other family members. Like I mentioned before, if you, the person said I was holding the baby and I spilled a cup of coffee on them, well, where's the burn on the parent? Or where where did the coffee spill? Let look around and see what ha what else happened. But you know, if you spill on a child, usually you will also spill on the parent um, if the parent's holding the child. Additionally, when you're looking at burns, some areas that you want to be more alarmed for. Posterior burns are very atypical. Um, bilateral burns are unusual. Buttock burns and lower extremity burns and then any circumferential burns. These three to four year olds that are being toilet trained, it becomes more common that as they, if they get in trouble, they'll, that's the more common uh, time for a burn is that uh, as they're being put in a bath that's overly hot um, or getting their hands rinsed with hot water um, as like a abuse for non-toilet training. Um, so they're looking at this circumferential, this could suggest submersion. Um, and on these two images, so this actually uh, was on Wikipedia documented as a hot glue gun burn, which maybe it could be. It also has a very distinct shape, which is a little atypical. Um, I, that's not how my hot glue gun looks. It looks like a point, not, <laughs> um, but I guess if you glued your hand like that, you could get, get that pattern. Um, this is potentially like a cigarette burn. Um, so looking for something that has more of a pattern to it can also suggest that there was abuse that occurred. If you see bite marks on your patient, so the distinction between whether you know it's a human versus an animal can become a little bit more vague. There is some data to say that if there, the spacing of the two canines is greater than 30 millimeters, it may be an adult human bite. Um, typically adult bite marks are more arched as opposed to like canine bite marks, which have a more narrow palate. Um, if you do see a bite mark and it appears fresh, make sure you're covering that very loosely. I advise that you do cover it, um, but make sure that the gauze that you place over it is very loose um, so that when the patient arrives at their destination, um, DNA samples can be collected if there appears to be a saliva on the wound itself. This is really the only one that we would collect specific uh, DNA samples from on, on the physical abuse side. Couple things that I want to point out though. So this child has slate gray nevi, can be easily mistaken for bruising, um, but will have been there from birth. These are not blanching. They are usually all in consistent coloration. So with this degree of if it was bruising, you would not see uh, this sort of patterning. It doesn't have it has very clear delineated edges, um, and it wouldn't usually be all in one consistent pattern. So this is a normal finding. And this is actually nevus flammaris, which was also known as port wine stain. This is on someone's leg. There's also more often on people's faces. So this can blanch, but would not be painful. It's not really warm, which a burn would be warm. It's not sloughing. Um, and so these, this is again a birthmark and again, something that you would find that is normal. So if you're feeling around the patient and you feel some lumps or bumps, um, you're gonna be worried about underlying fracture um, or um, it, asking and see if there's any easy bruising or signs that there's a big swelling or hematoma occurring. Um, so these are other signs to look for on your musculoskeletal exam.
So neuro and development, this can be really important. Um, there are huge things you can look at if you really want to dive deep into neurodevelopment. But um, so you're going to start with, you can do a quick, brief reflex check. So if they grab your hand, uh, if they're sucking, if they're grasping, if they have a Babinski, so their toes are going up. Um, those are, are helpful findings. Uh, the reflexes do disappear though. So they suck should disappear around six months of age, which actually makes sense because if you think around six months, they start to grab things and put them in their mouth. Um, so they need to be able to control their suck reflex. Um, the grass also goes around, it goes away around six months for the same reason. They need to be able to start grabbing things. And if they automatically grab when they don't want to, that's not very helpful. The Babinski where the toe goes up goes away around 12 months because they have to be able to walk and walking with your toes up doesn't work. Um, then finally, the fontanelles, they should be closed about 12 to 18 months of age. So if you're still, uh, if you are assessing a baby, those will be gone by that point. Um, though if they are still present, that can be a sign of other things, but um, that you wouldn't expect to find them necessarily. So some basic skills, rather than trying to memorize developmental charts, just they smile by about two months of age, they grab and roll by about six months of age, they can sit by about eight months. So these are things that you should know because a baby that they're saying rolled off the bed again at two months of age probably shouldn't be doing that. Um, but a baby that walked and crawled over a gate and fell down the stairs, they can do that at 18 months of age. So some studies do say that about 10 months of age is really the earliest that they could climb into a tub. So if a parent is reporting a kid climbed into a tub and got burnt, that is unlikely in children under the age of 10 months of age. They just can't physically get themselves over and into a tub. Really the latest that a child would be able to do that is, is 15 months of age. And, and then beyond 15 months, they all can get into a tub pretty much. For talking, so if you're trying to get a story or discuss things with a child, remember that you're not gonna get a lot out of a one-year-old. So this is about how much of the language you can understand. So you can understand about one, uh, one fourth of all child language by the age of one about two fourths of what they're saying by age two, three fourths by age three and four fourths by age four. So you can actually have a conversation somewhere between three and four years of age. So don't expect to get a conversation or a true story out of anyone under the age of four because they just can't communicate it to you. Sometimes there's really verbal two and three year olds, but even then they can't necessarily communicate a story very well. In terms of social aspects, they do start to be afraid of strangers, and they should be afraid of strangers starting about eight, nine months of age, and by 15 to 18 months, they should be really terrified of strangers. In fact, when they're not, that's actually a sign that there's potentially some dissociation with the parent. They do have a lot of magical thinking around age two. They start to have some great ideas, but it does make it a little harder to get a good story out of a two to five year old because they have this sort of magical thoughts and can come up with great ideas about what's going on. And they truly believe as a, a two year old, they believe what they are saying is true. So a they don't mean to make it up or lie, um, but they a two year old, if you go out of sight, if they go out of sight, they assume that they can't be seen. Um, so they have a lot of like magic ideas. The concept of time doesn't really exist until about the age of four. So they may say it happened yesterday, but that doesn't mean that it did. <laughs> so saying something about a time frame to a child under the age of four or even around the age of four is really not going to give you a, a great time frame of when things occurred. If you want even more information about ages and social development and all the developmental stages. So there's stage agesandstages.com or there's healthychildren.org. Both of them have great resources for really knowing more about this. But I think these are the important factors to know in terms of assessing the child. Are they appropriate developmentally? So going back to the pediatric patient we talked about at the beginning, the baby. Um, so some of the factors, this baby was the youngest, the youngest of of five, there's four other siblings at home, that increases the risks of abuse. Child had greater than two siblings and had some failure to thrive, had not really been gaining weight appropriately when they went to the primary care doctor's office. 
and talking to mom, we had noticed that lack of interaction, that's a red flag. There's a delay of care. The patient didn't make it to their follow-up appointment, didn't show up for everything that they were supposed to. And then we've noted some notable social stressors that occurred with this particular patient. The family had some financial concerns, um, there, and then there was some maternal depression on prior pregnancies, and, and just a general sort of things that made you a little bit more concerned. There's a faint bruise that is appreciated on full exam when you fully look at everything. And then there's that subconjunctival hemorrhage, as I mentioned previously. So all of these things led to this patient being more thoroughly evaluated for a non-accidental trauma. Uh, the child got full x-ray screening and a head CT and did end up having a small head bleed, a femur fracture, and some rib fractures, all of which suggested that this child did sustain a non-accidental trauma and likely had a pretty large forceful uh, exertion on the chest, which caused that subconjunctival hemorrhage. So it was really important that really the only subtle findings were these, these faint bruise and the subconjunctival hemorrhage. And these can be easily missed, especially when the patient wasn't presenting for anything other than being a little bit more fussy. So ultimately, what's our disposition for these particular patients? So you're going to want to bring them to a, a, a center that can manage a pediatric patient, right? You don't want them at a hospital that doesn't have a pediatric specific emergency department or pediatric pediatricians who can care for and evaluate the patient. If you're really seriously worried about trauma, you're going to want to make sure that they're going to a trauma destination. So here in Maryland, that's Johns Hopkins. Um, so somewhere that can take care of these patients appropriately. Obviously, if they're over 15, Usually they give you the story of the trauma themselves, but they that is would go to, to shock trauma. But these are really important that we're getting them to the correct destination so that they receive appropriate care. A lot of the hospitals that do have pediatric emergency departments do have the ability to at least do initial assessments and evaluations for non-accidental trauma. But it's also important that you recognize and identify it to make sure that they get to those destinations. So sometimes that takes a little convincing. Sometimes it takes a little convincing for me too to make sure that the parents like that came in for, you know, jaundice is going to stay <laughs> and get the full workup. So I think there's a few things. These are some of the my quotes from things that I've said to, to people. Um, you know, I think that things on the exam suggest maybe a more serious injury. That's really helpful if they brought them in for an injury or they're bringing them for an injury. And you say, because of this, I think we got to bring them to a hospital that's best able to handle injuries for children. Or when we see this specific finding, we want to make sure a child's safe. We all want them to be safe, right? You want the, the child to be safe. Um, we need to bring him to a hospital that will make sure that this child has is safe and that everything's taken care of. Or maybe even it's concerning for underlying issues, maybe some other medical causes that increase the risk of other injuries. Or and sometimes you even say the word abuse because sometimes the parent hasn't said the word, but they're suspicious of somebody else abusing their child. And so that's a serious consideration as well. So if, if you are having those troubles convincing a parent like or a parent who wants to go to a specific destination, making sure that they are understanding why you're, you're offering or suggesting a different location. So when you get to the emergency department, probably the most important thing is just communicating everything you find that's concerning. If you find a wound, it's actually really important that you should suggest to, to the physician that they might wanna look at it right away because sometimes there are specific ones that will sort of fade over time. Um, you know, a, a slap wound where you can see the, all the, the hand um, might not be as visible as time goes on. And, you know, seeing that in, in as soon as you possibly can can really be helpful. We can document timing and the change over time. And if you're concerned, just contact CPS. And ultimately, the, you know, the workup will continue in the emergency department. We work these children up for not just non-accidental trauma, but we also look for reasons why they would fracture more easily? Do they have underlying conditions? Uh, people will go to the scene. CPS can go and do a more forensic investigation to see if everything's legitimate. Do, you know, did the kid really sit in a bouncy seat that they claimed that they had sitting on the counter? Is the counter really as high as they said that it was? And they'll do all those measurements and things like that. Um, so making sure that they get contacted can really save the patient's life. So ultimately, you know, these are truly important. And 
like I said, half of them do get missed. So anyone who is identifying it and anyone who can help find them can potentially save a child's life and prevent that more secondary injury going down the line, such as the abusive head trauma, and ultimately prevent that from happening and prevent those 20% mortality rates. Um, and that's not even to include all of the morbidity from having a, a traumatic head injury. If they, if they survive, there's a lot of long-term complications for those children. Um, so you have a lot of ability to, to really help these patients. Um, so some takeaways, just make sure you're really thinking about the eyes and the mouth. So if you notice something in the eyes and the mouth of a patient, even if they're calling for some other reason, um, it's one of the most commonly missed causes of uh, signs of non-accidental trauma. And they're one of the most common findings that are uh, occur and then have a secondary occurrence of abuse that happens later. So um, if you see that, say something, uh, remember 10, four faces, Oh, there should be any e in there. Um, so 10, four faces P. Um, if you see any of those bruising patterns, uh, then you should be concerned about non-accidental trauma. Burns are suspicious. Even if it was a clearly accidental burn, there's concern for neglect. So check the scene. If you can make sure you can confirm what, what the family is, is saying. And then, you know, if they say they burn themselves on a, a fireplace, if they don't have a fireplace, that's unusual. Um, if they don't have an iron and there's an, uh, there's an iron reported, right. Um, you know, see if, if what they're saying is, is reasonable. Um, and when concerned, really transport to a children's hospital that can manage these patients and, Remember, a careful assessment can really save these children's lives. Any questions? No. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect, thank you. That was a very interesting and, and sadly a very pertinent conversation. Um, I've been riding the ambulance for many years, and sadly we see this. There's um, when in the fire department there is a legal requirement to report. Um, not just to say to the ER, I suspect. Within the on the ambulance itself, you are also required to report, and that can be brought through the chain of command, but it, it can't be passed off to the hospital. And it's sooner rather than later, because if we're there, we're in the house and we can be joined. Um, uh, again, Maryland has two uh, level one trauma centers for, for, for major piece trauma, but there's many pediatric ERs and they probably would see more of this than any of the trauma centers is my guess. Um, and, but that's also a good place. And if you have a suspicion, in addition to telling the, through the chain of command, you need to report that to the emergency room also. Um, but we'll open up for questions for Dr. Stefanos. So yeah. feel free to unmute if you have comments. I see. Joel has a comment. Feel free to unmute and share your comment. Uh, I, I agree with Shannon that if you talk to an abuser, that's solved the problem 98% of the time because that's, that's a very good thing. Uh, no child should be harmed. Yeah, I that I was actually surprised at that data when I found it as well. That's from the National Child Abuse Foundation. Um, I believe yeah, that's where the, that's who reported that. Um, I I agree. I'm not sure that it's, I think that's a very hopeful number as well. Um, but that is what they have documented is that once intervention, now that again, some of that intervention may be taking the children away from that entire situation. So I don't I don't know if that's okay too. <laughs> uh, Hi, hey, uh, I just want to add, uh, thank you so much for the information. Um, I, uh, I just want to add that, you know, my, my kids uh, do jujitsu and wrestling, okay? They've been doing it since they were four, 
years old. I mean, my daughter's six, 10 years old now. My son is uh, almost eight. And, uh, you know, I've had CPS personally called on me uh, because they have they have bruising on their torso. They have bruising on their legs. Um, you know, they do grappling sports. So, you know, I just want to uh, tell pre-hospital providers, I'm a paramedic myself, um, not to assume, not to, uh, you know, go on scene and just, you know, blatantly state because naturally we want to go there and solve the problem. We want to kind of be detectives in that case, um, in situations like that. Don't assume anything. Don't break that trust between, you know, parents because if you assume anything like that, you are automatically breaking that trust and you are automatically the enemy in their eyes. So, um, you know, just find, you know, do your assessment, uh, state your findings to the hospital and, and you know, report whatever you have to report. But don't be accusatory in that situation. And that's all I want to say. Yeah, I think I, I agree. There's there's a lot of examples where um, there's very plausible reasons for the injuries that do occur um, and making sure that we're getting an accurate history and story from the family, right? Like, oh, where did these bruises come from? Oh, well, they they they, they participate in jujitsu, ju like that's sure. Um, uh, so getting a, a little bit more information is, is crucial for those types of things. Then, you know, I've had some really crazy stories, like I said, and I've, then I've had families be like, oh, and here's the video. Like, you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it actually happened. <laughs> um, and sometimes actually the more unbelievable the story, the, the more real it, it seems because they, you just can't make some of the stories up that, that some of these, uh, that happened to some people. Um, but I, I agree, making sure that, that you aren't automatically assuming or accusing, um, but I do think sometimes we do need to make sure that we're making sure that there's not other injuries, right? So that's that's the biggest thing is, is the safety of the child. So making sure that if you notice a bunch of injuries that that's communicated um, and that you that the next team taking over uh, could continue that. And yes, if you are concerned enough, um, if there are certain things that are enough red flags that are going off for you, then you should be reporting to CPS um, as soon as you see that. In the comments, uh, Baltimore County, am I muted? Okay, I, uh, Adult and Child Protective Services, which is 410-887-8463. I keep that in my cell phone. I send one of the field doctors, we're required to report and then I, I don't consider myself an investigator at all. My job is just to report and let the professional investigators do it because there's, I, I, I don't have any experience in investigating it. I, I take care of the kids at the hospital, but I'm not an investigator. And it's just everything's so multifactorial that you need a professional investigator. And there's, as long as everything's done in good faith, you know, there, there's no penalty in reporting. <laughs> Accidents happen. Sometimes accidents don't happen, but it's it's not for me to determine. And again, as we said earlier, if something did happen. There's a 98 percent chance you can prevent the future because the last thing you ever want to see is the child show up dead in the ED at a future event. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, I thank you very much. For us, the nice that for us getting the information about anything you saw on the scene is so helpful because you know we're going to have to disposition this child from the emergency department probably sooner than CPS can get out there and do what they'll have to do a, a very thorough investigation. But if you say, you know, they said they fell downstairs, there's no stairs or, <laughs> or they said they sp spilled hot water everywhere and there's no water everywhere. Uh, <laughs> That's that's a, a red flag, right? And we got we have uh, much more information um, or things that were were said or seen on the scene um, can be super helpful and communicated. Um, and going back to the documentation, I, the biggest thing is quotes. Um, you know, don't again, don't try to get a whole history out of a kid. You don't have to do that. That's a forensic investigator. They're trained to do that. Um, but anything that is said, putting it in quotes. Um, and just documenting clearly, I saw this, 
on the patient or I saw this at the scene um, that made me concerned. Uh, again, for people to get uh, credit for MIMS for recertification, the cycle is just starting for many people. So this is a very simple way to get it over, over, the, over the course of the year. I, I strongly recommend it. Um, we have another question. This one. Are we, it's a very interesting question. Are we allowed to photograph the scene or does that exceed our scope of care? Uh, do you have any comments on this before I say anything? Uh, I actually don't know your legal thing. So we always, everything we take pictures of goes directly into our charts. So it's, no. it's interesting in Maryland, the, what you're allowed to record um, depends whether you're in a public space or a private home, that's number one, whether you're allowed to record video or not. Um, I don't, on the ambulance, we do not carry cameras where we record stuff inside people's homes. I know we've taken pictures of accident scenes to show the EV, but that's in a public area. On the other side, you can have the police join you at the scene, and when they show up, they all have body cameras that record wherever they're at and they're allowed to record. I know in the fire department, we are not allowed to record uh, patient care while we're performing it. That's a policy that exists currently. Uh, we don't wear body cameras. We don't have any mechanisms for storing the data uh, or any HIPAA controls on it. However, the police have different set of rules and they have different systems in place. So if there's ever a doubt, have the police respond and they can join you at the scene and they can do a lot more. But I know in the EMS side, we're not allowed to be video in what we're doing as we do it. Uh, Bonnie is correct. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, so she wrote, recording or taking pictures from your personal device, make sure it's her personal device open for evidence. Yeah. Um, it's true. Everyone loves to get that subpoena nailed to the wall at the station. Yeah. All right, well, we'll stop recording at this point. If anyone wants to stay on for any other talk or commentary, we can do that.